Well, hey guys, in today's video, we're going to be covering six signs that you have too much yeast. Specifically, I'm going to be covering six skin findings associated with too much of the yeast malassezia. To be clear, there are other yeasts that can cause skin rashes like candida yeast. We're not going to be covering those in today's video. We're only going to be focusing on skin problems that arise as a result of too much malassezia yeast. What the heck is malassezia? It's a yeast that's actually part of everyone's skin. It's perfectly normal to have this yeast on your skin. However, in certain circumstances, certain situations, the yeast can get a little bit too comfortable, proliferate too much, your immune system might decide to rebel against it and it can cause certain types of skin problems. One thing you need to understand about malassezia is that most of the species on your skin actually require external lipids to survive. Guess where they get these lipids? From the sebum in your pores, oil, the oil that you make. Problem number one is something called head and neck dermatitis. Head and neck dermatitis is actually a subtype of atopic dermatitis. And what it is is a rash that appears on the head and neck, as the name implies, specifically on the eyelids particularly. It also can cover the forehead, the sides of the neck, and extend into the scalp. It's pretty itchy, and sometimes it can even be accompanied by little hives, especially on the side of the neck. Now, the interesting thing about this condition, it affects people who have atopic dermatitis. Their body, for whatever reason, decides that it is going to mount an allergy against certain proteins in the malassezia ye yeast, which again, is part of everyone's natural skin flora. So you develop rashes to the yeast in your skin, and these rashes are most problematic when you sweat because sweat actually releases the proteins that you, from the yeast that you are allergic to. The reason this happens probably has a lot to do with the underlying immune dysregulation in the skin of people who have atopic dermatitis accompanied by the fact that with atopic dermatitis, there's a problem with the skin barrier integrity. They have a higher skin pH. This is very uh, conducive to overgrowth of malassezia. Comment below on if you have ever heard of Dupixent or seen the commercials. This is a medication that is used to treat atopic dermatitis, but a side effect of it is actually uh, head and neck dermatitis. My number one tip, don't try and self-diagnose this because it can look a lot like other things which also are common in people who have atopic dermatitis, namely contact dermatitis. In some cases, testing may be required to really know for sure. Specifically, an IgE prick test will look for an allergy to the proteins on malassezia. It can be treated, treated with a combination of anti-inflammatories and antifungals. Anti fungals can either be applied to the skin or taken by mouth. And anti-inflammatories can be applied to the skin to help this along further. Topical anti-inflammatories, namely triamcinolone, a steroid cream. Topical antifungals, ketoconazole, clitrimazole, help reduce the burden of that yeast. Oral antifungals would be itraconazole or fluconazole. Number two is a heck of a lot more common than head and neck dermatitis, and that is seborrheic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis typically involves the face, but it can happen anywhere where you have hair. It loves the skin here on the sides of the nose. It also likes to be in the eyebrows. This part, known as the glabella, is a common area. You have a lot of oil glands on your chest, so many people develop it there. You can develop it in the genital area. The way it looks is a red rash. It has an overlying uh, scale that is described as greasy and or yellow. Some cases of seborrheic dermatitis, you can have little red bumps, and those bumps can be filled with pus. Seborrheic dermatitis is a pretty common skin condition. A lot of people have it. If you're someone with a deeper skin tone, seborrheic dermatitis can look a lot different. Uh, seborrheic dermatitis can actually have a hypopigmentation. Uh, so it can, it definitely looks a lot different on deeper skin tones, but it's especially more common in men as opposed to women, probably because men have larger oil glands. It's also very common in patients who have underlying problems with their immune system, especially those who have HIV. For whatever reason, stubborn seborrheic dermatitis seems to be a problem in people with certain neurologic disorders, namely Parkinson's disease and spinal cord injury. Seborrheic dermatitis can look an awful lot like some other skin conditions, namely acne and rosacea. Rosacea tends to favor the convex surfaces of the face, whereas seborrheic dermatitis likes the concave surfaces. Acne, on the other hand, is different from seborrheic dermatitis. And yes, you can have the red bumps, you can have the bumps filled with pus, but with acne specifically, you're gonna have 
blackheads and whiteheads, aka comedones. There are no comedones with seborrheic dermatitis. There's really no way to cure it. It can burn out on its own. It's a chronic skin condition. It comes and goes. It tends to flare in the winter time for whatever reason, as well as early spring. It can flare if you get sick, run down, or if you're really, really stressed out. It's controlled with topical antifungals like ketoconazole or clotrimazole to reduce the burden of malassezia. In, in the setting of a flare of seborrheic dermatitis where you have a lot of redness, maybe you have some itch, a topical steroid medicine can be uh, prescribed. There are concerns with using topical steroids indefinitely on the face. You can develop side effects, which are not good. So instead, if it's looking to be where you have more stubborn seborrheic dermatitis, you're getting a lot of flares, a lot of redness, your dermatologist may elect to transition you over to a steroid sparing topical anti-inflammatory. These are most commonly going to be in the family known as calcineurin inhibitors. They include tacrolimus or pimcrolimus, aka protopic or elodil. Because malassezia thrives in oiliness, sebum, um, low-dose eye accutane, isotretinoin, may be uh, pursued to reduce sebum output helping overall in controlling the disease. And that's an option for, for some people. Number three is very much related to seborrheic dermatitis. And in fact, it, it's basically the same thing. That is dandruff. Dandruff specifically occurs on the scalp. Most people have heard of dandruff, you get flakes in the scalp. In contrast to seborrheic dermatitis, which you might see on the face or elsewhere on the body, with dandruff, you really don't have that background redness. You just have the flakes. The flakes um, occur in patches. And similar to seborrheic dermatitis, dandruff can come and go, flares again in the winter time. It can also flare if you're wearing a lot of hats. It's aggravated again by excessive sebum. So people who shampoo their scalp infrequently are more vulnerable to developing flares of dandruff. Uh, but in contrast to seborrheic dermatitis, dandruff typically is drier flakes. You don't have that greasiness to dandruff typically. And again, you don't have the background redness. Babies can have dandruff. It's known as cradle cap. They typically outgrow it. At puberty, when those sebaceous oil glands start cranking up, then dandruff can recur. I have a whole video on how to prevent dandruff flares where I go into detail, but as a reminder, shampooing your scalp, not your hair strands, your scalp, directing shampoo lather to your scalp as frequently as your hair type will tolerate is one of the best approaches because it cuts down on the sebum up there. Then of course you have medicated anti-dandruff shampoos, selenium sulfide, zinc pyrithione, salicylic acid, and ketoconazole. These are anti-inflammatory and they help cut down on the burden of the yeast. When you're using an anti-dandruff shampoo, again, direct it to the scalp, leave it on there for a few minutes so it'll really soak into the skin and then rinse it out. After you rinse it out, come in with a conditioner to your hair strands to help keep the hair manageable. I know in Europe they use peroctone olamine, but truthfully there's not much research to support that ingredient for dandruff. It's not something we use here, um, and so I'm not familiar with how effective it is. If your dandruff is really stubborn and really bothersome and it's not budging with over-the-counter medicated anti-dandruff shampoos, see a board-certified dermatologist that way, A, you confirm that it's dandruff, and B, there are certain prescription treatments that get better control in some cases, help control the itch. Number four is neonatal acne. And I say that in air quotes because it's not actually acne. It's uh, just called that, neonatal acne. As the name implies, this is something that impacts babies, neonates, uh, early on in life. Basically, you know, when they come out, they're not like fully developed in terms of their immune system and immune responses are kind of slow. And for this reason, malassezia can get a little too comfortable in baby's skin and they can get little red bumps, most often on the cheeks. It's more common in boys, but it can happen in both boys and girls. Unlike true acne, neonatal acne does not scar and it's gonna go away by four months of age with no treatment. Treatment can be offered, in which case ketoconazole cream is usually prescribed or maybe clotrimazole, uh, and that can help it clear up faster. But no treatment is needed for neonatal acne. Now in contrast, babies can develop true acne. It's a called infantile acne. Uh, infantile acne, unlike neonatal acne, is true acne. It has comedones, blackheads, whiteheads. It, has, uh, it can have cysts, nodules, and it can scar if left untreated. Infantile acne happens anywhere from three months of age to 16 months of age, whereas neonatal, air quotes, acne happens much, much younger. Um, so that's kind of another distinguishing feature between the two. Number five, tinea versicolor. I know a lot of you guys deal with this. Uh, it's also called pityriasis versicolor. Very common, tends to affect teens, young adults, and 
it, it can be really stubborn actually. Uh, it doesn't indicate necessarily that you have any underlying health problems. It, it's pretty common. It, it's, most, uh, it's most common in areas where you have a lot of humidity, high heat. It's very common in tropical environments because again, you've got a lot of sweat and mixed with your oil. It just ends up making for a more favorable environment for malassezia yeast. And what it does is it creates a rash that can be these little discrete spots or they can start to coalesce and be confluent. They're brown or they're deep pigmented. Sometimes, you know, they can look white depending on your background skin tone. They really favor the, like the upper torso, the chest. Again, there are a lot of oil glands there on your chest and in your upper back. Uh, also can happen on the sides of the neck the face, I mean, really anywhere. In some cases it's itchy. Now, as I pointed out, it doesn't necessarily indicate there's anything wrong with your health. Um, however, if you'll recall from my video on signs your cortisol is too high, people who have the condition Cushing syndrome where your cortisol is too high, they tend to have issues with uh, malassezia and they, they often have tinea versicolor can, can often occur in those folks, probably because, you know, again, they're, they're immune suppressed and so their body is not really keeping the malassezia in check, making this more of an issue for them. Now with tinea versicolor, in contrast to some of the other conditions that we've talked about, you have the yeast kind of overgrowing in these patches. And if you look under the microscope, you know, you take a biopsy of the skin, um, what's unique about tinea versicolor is that not only do you see the yeast, but you also see what are called hyphae, these little like strands of yeast in, in the skin. It's referred to as spaghetti and meatballs. Um, so that's how, that's one way it's diagnosed as well as just the clinical appearance of it. And one cool, if you will, thing about this condition as well as other malassezia conditions is that we have a special tool in dermatology called a woods lamp. Uh, so your derm may turn out the lights, put this lamp on and the skin lesions can fluoresce yellow. So that's another clue that it's malassezia. Treating tinea versicolor um, is, is very frustrating on, for the patient because it often recurs, especially it, it may be the kind of thing where you get good treatment results, it clears up and summer's over or whatever, and then next summer, boom, it comes right back. Or you're someone who works out a lot, sweaty conditions, and it just keeps coming back. That, that's often the nature of things. So there are a variety of different treatments. Uh, one of the go-tos uh, for people who have this is to get the anti-dandruff shampoo, Selsun Blue. You don't have to get that brand name per se. Just look for an anti-dandruff shampoo with the active ingredient, selenium sulfide. And what you're gonna do is uh, you lather this to the areas where you have tinea versicolor. So if it's on your chest, you're gonna lather it all there. So you leave that on the skin for a few minutes and then you rinse it off just to really let that selenium sulfide soak in there. You're gonna do that daily for a month uh, and that can help get rid of it. And then after that, do it once a month as maintenance to keep it from coming back. Now at first, you know, some people that's not enough. It'll come back regardless of you doing that. There are other medications that can be prescribed, topical antifungals. There's a topical antifungal shampoo, 2% uh, ketoconazole shampoo is stronger than what you buy over the counter. You can, you know, that might be prescribed as a topical antifungal. You can lather it to these areas in a similar fashion. That can get you good results. In very stubborn cases, an oral antifungal like itraconazole or um, fluconazole may be prescribed and that'll help get rid of it faster, but again, it doesn't keep it from coming back. To keep it from coming back, you really need to uh, do your best to stay on top of the maintenance of doing like the once a month anti-dandruff shampoo treatment. And also be mindful of sweaty conditions, like change out of sweaty clothing, because that is very favorable to the malassezia. When you get very sweaty, make sure you get in the shower and rinse the sweat off clean the skin efficiently. That way you're not hanging out in sweat. That, that tends to favor the formation of tinea versicolor. Now, as I said at the beginning of the video, you know, this yeast really thrives in your sebum. So if you're doing things like taking performance enhancing drugs or testosterone that can increase sebum production, this may be more of an issue for you uh, and more recalcitrant, more stubborn, constantly coming back because you've got a lot more sebum production going on. So modifying those dietary supplements accordingly, you know, can help out as well. And number six, malassezia folliculitis. Um, it's not technically acne, it's, it's a folliculitis, which basically means that the malassezia has taken over, gotten too comfortable in the follicle, the pore. 
And it's different from acne because unlike acne, there are no comedones, there are no blackheads and whiteheads. Instead, what you get are red bumps, all roughly the same size and appearance. Um, most often, like on the upper chest, the back, again, these are areas where you have a lot of oil glands, but you know, sometimes can happen on the forehead. All the bumps roughly look the same, and there's some background redness. It can be pretty itchy. While true acne can itch, um, fungal acne, aka malassezia folliculitis, definitely itches. A lot of times people who develop this also have concomitant seborrheic dermatitis as well. Now, people who are at risk for developing this are people who are immunosuppressed, like people who get prednisone or people who are on, uh, you know, immunosuppressed because of their background medical conditions. People who are on prolonged courses of oral antibiotics can develop this because antibiotics disrupt your skin microbiome, your skin flora, and that may tip malassezia over the edge to, to go on ham in the follicle. People who have blood cancers, like lymphoma, leukemia, they're at risk for developing this. Otherwise, healthy people can develop it too, especially if you live somewhere very tropical, very humid, you wear occlusive clothing, this can trigger it for some people as well. And again, if you're taking a medication or a dietary supplement that increases sebum, like testosterone, for example, that certainly can put you at risk for this. Itches and you, know, you may think you have acne, you may be misdiagnosed as having acne. I think that's where it you know, popularly became referred to in the public as fungal acne. How is this diagnosed? Well, clinically, the way it looks, the history, you know, itch, the history of if you were immunosuppressed, you have leukemia, lymphoma, you've been on long courses of antibiotics, or maybe you, know, you live somewhere super tropical and it's, it's something that is more, more common. Uh, as well as uh, a skin biopsy, biopsy can be taken. And in the skin biopsy, what you're gonna see is within the follicle, it's gonna be chock full of malassezia. In some cases, you may have some pus there. And if the derm takes that and looks at it in the microscope, they can often see they can often see these little yeast. So, you know, it's, that's, how, that's part of how it's diagnosed, as well as that woods lamp can come in handy. You may see some yellow fluorescence. All of those things together can really help nail the diagnosis of pterosporum folliculitis or malassezia folliculitis. Things that would be prescribed to treat this are gonna be an oral antifungal or even a topical antifungal can actually get rid of it quite efficiently. You know, it was always thought that you needed an oral antifungal to treat this because it's down in the follicle and the pore. Well, truthfully, oral antifungal versus topical antifungal, they both can get uh, a cure, a, you know, clearance. It just takes longer with a topical antifungal. Selenium sulfide anti-dandruff shampoos can also be highly valuable, used in the same way. They're used uh, for tinea versicolor, just lather to the affected areas, leave that on the skin for a few minutes, and then rinse off. Do it daily uh, for anywhere from three days to a month. After a given period of time of doing it daily, you can switch over to doing it just once a week uh, to, to maintain control. And this is gonna be important, you know, if you live somewhere that's really humid and, and you deal with, with malassezia related issues, or, you know, if you have a background medical history where you've got some underlying immune problems or you're on medications that make you more susceptible to this, and you may be needed, it may be necessary to do this on a more routine weekly maintenance basis. All right, y'all, those are the six skin signs. You have too much malassezia yeast, aka pterosporum. Now, in summary, malassezia, it's normal on your skin. You don't want to eradicate it because then things can go awry. But in certain situations, certain circumstances, it can get too comfortable, your immune system can act up against it, and you can develop these specific skin problems that we covered in today's video. Don't try and diagnose them yourself because it can look an awful lot like other types of skin conditions. See a board certified dermatologist to know for sure what you are dealing with. That way they can not only give you the right diagnosis, but they can help you with the best treatment approach for you. Because honestly, you know, with these types of skin problems that arise from too much malassezia, it's not a cookbook approach as far as treatment either. Some things are going to be better options for some patients. You know, some of these things we talked about in today's video, uh, like topical antifungals, if you have extensive areas of the skin problem related to malassezia, it might be too challenging for, for you to use a topical in those areas like the back, for example, uh, in which case an oral may be more appropriate for you. I hope this video was helpful to you guys. Now on the end slate, I'm going to put my recent video on skin signs of food allergies. So definitely check that one out. I know y'all love these uh, signs of type videos and I have them all saved in a playlist. So definitely check them out. We cover like skin signs of low iron, low thyroid, 
uh, B12 deficiency, lots of vitamin deficiencies. You're not going to want to miss those videos. They're, they're high yield, high yield information if you care about skin and health. Anyway, y'all, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.